Christians claim that Jesus is God, the second person of the Trinity, the divine Son of the Father. And yet, in the Gospel of John, chapter 5, verse 30, Jesus says, I can do nothing on my own. Does it make any sense whatsoever for God to say that he can't do anything on his own? This verse was popularized by Muslim apologists. Following Zakir Naik, they usually quote the King James translation, I can of mine own self do nothing. You see, God is all-powerful. Jesus says he can't do anything on his own. Does this sound like something God would say? Muslims around the world now quote John 5.30 to show Christians that we got our theology wrong. We somehow missed this clear verse for nearly 2,000 years. Fortunately for us, Muslim apologists found the verse and shared it with us to correct our dumb theologians. When our Muslim friends bring up this verse, it may be helpful to ask a quick question. The question I would ask Muslims who quote John 5.30 is this. Can you tell me one word Jesus said in the rest of John chapter 5? Can you tell me a single word from the rest of the chapter? Because if you're quoting John 5 to show that Jesus was a mere human being, I don't think you've actually read the chapter. This is an ongoing problem with Islamic apologists. If I were to quote a Quran verse out of context, in a way that completely distorts the meaning, they would suddenly understand the importance of reading an entire passage. But when they go to the Bible, the most basic, fundamental rules of interpreting a text go out the window. Let me show you what I mean. So, Jesus says in John 5.30, I can do nothing on my own. Our Muslim friends insist this verse proves that Jesus was just a man, a helpless human being, certainly not God. But last time I checked, if we're reading verse 30 of a chapter, there are 29 verses that come before it in that chapter. Perhaps we should look and see what those verses say so we can make sure we're not twisting the words of Jesus. Our Muslim friends respect Jesus and wouldn't want to misrepresent what he said, right? So they'll definitely want to read the passage carefully with us, won't they? I'll just summarize the first 15 verses of John 5. Jesus heals a man on the Sabbath, and this upsets the Jewish leaders. They regard miraculously healing someone as work, and you're not allowed to work on the Sabbath. We'll pick up the story in verse 16. This is verse 16 of the same chapter Islam's greatest apologists go to when they want to debunk Christian theology. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My Father is working until now, and I am working. Uh-oh. It's the Sabbath, but Jesus says that he's working because the Father is working. This might not seem like a big deal to someone in the 21st century, but it was a huge deal to 1st century Jews. Jews weren't allowed to work on the Sabbath. However, there was a debate among the Jewish rabbis about whether God works on the Sabbath. Some of them reasoned that since God upholds and sustains the universe even on the Sabbath, God works on the Sabbath. Jews don't get to work on the Sabbath, but God works on the Sabbath. That was their reasoning. How does Jesus answer the Jewish leaders when they complain that he's working on the Sabbath? He says, My father is working until now, and I am working. Like father, like son, as the saying goes. Now, if rabbis are discussing the Sabbath, and they conclude that even though they're not allowed to work on the Sabbath, God works on the Sabbath, and some guy comes along and says, yeah, that's why I'm working on the Sabbath. Like father, like son, what does it sound like he's claiming? It sounds like he's putting himself in the same category with God, rather than in the mere human being category. 
And as the next verse shows, that's exactly what the Jewish leaders thought he was saying. Look at the heading, by the way. Verse 18, this was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. In the Bible, people or groups of people can be called sons of God or children of God in various senses. For instance, we're all children of God in the sense that God created all of us. This is the basis for Ahmed Didat's sons by the tons response. Oh, you claim that Jesus is the son of God, but God has lots of sons in the Bible. Yeah, there are lots of sons of God in the Bible, but the phrase son of God is used in very different ways. The question is, what does the phrase son of God mean when it's applied to Jesus? Does it mean something more than when it's applied to, say, me? In John 5, Jesus is clearly claiming to be the Son of God in a very special and unique way. When he says that the Father is working on the Sabbath, so he's working on the Sabbath, the religious leaders consider this blasphemy because he's calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. Notice, the Jews here think that Jesus is claiming to be a separate God, a separate deity. He's the Son who's equal with God, but who can act on his own, separate from the Father. They think he's claiming to be another God who's equal to God. Now, if our Muslim friends are right about Jesus, and he's a merely human prophet, how should he respond when the Jewish leaders conclude that he's claiming to be another God who's equal with God? Shouldn't he correct the misunderstanding of the Jewish leaders by saying, wait, you think I'm claiming to be another God who's equal to God? You totally misunderstood me. I'm only human, just like the rest of you. If our Muslim friends are right, that's how Jesus should respond. But if Christians are right, and Jesus is the divine Son who has the nature and attributes of God and who is one with the Father, he should correct their misunderstanding by saying, Wait, you think I'm claiming to be a separate God? I'm not claiming to be a separate God. Yes, I'm God, but I don't act on my own as some extra deity. Everything I do comes from the Father, because I'm one with the Father. So, we know how Jesus is going to respond if Muslims are right, and we know how Jesus is going to respond if Christians are right. Let's see what Jesus does, and which view is confirmed by Jesus. Verse 19, so Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord. Oh no, Christians, Jesus says that he can do nothing of his own accord. This sounds very similar to verse 30, where, you'll recall, Jesus declares, I can do nothing on my own. But wait a minute. When Jesus says that he can do nothing of his own accord, does he mean that he's a helpless human being? Or does he mean that he can't do anything separately from the Father because he's one with the Father? Let's at least read the entire verse before we decide. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. Jesus does whatever the Father does? What mere human being, what mere prophet could ever say, whatever God does, I do that too. So, when Jesus says, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, is he claiming to be a mere human being, or is he claiming to be the divine Son who's one with the Father and therefore can't do anything separately from the Father? Let's keep reading. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing, and greater works than these will he show him so that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. 
If the Father raises the dead, so does the Son. Why? Because, as Jesus said, whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. Like Father, like Son. Let's continue. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son. Here we have a theological red alert. Jesus says that the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son. The Son is the final judge. But according to the Old Testament, God is the final judge. In chapter 3 of the book of the prophet Joel, God declares that the nations will be gathered and that he will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. The Quran also claims that God is the final judge. Judge in Surah 22, verse 56, Allah declares, The sovereignty on that day, the day of judgment, will be that of Allah, the one who has no partners. He will judge between them. Allah is the final judge, according to Islam. But Jesus says, The Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son. There are two main possibilities here. Either the Bible and the Quran are wrong and God isn't the final judge because he's handed all judgment over to a helpless human being, or God is indeed the final judge because Jesus is God and within the nature of the one God, the Father has given all judgment to the Son. But why would the Father give all judgment to the Son? Jesus tells us. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Father and Son are one, but the Father hands all judgment over to the Son, so that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Tell me, do we honor mere human beings the same way we honor the Father? Of course we don't. Do we honor human prophets the same way we honor the Father? Absolutely not. What is the only possible basis for honoring the Son just as we honor the Father? The only way we would honor the Son just as we honor the Father is if the Son has the same nature and attributes as the Father. Side note, where did Jesus say, I am God, worship me? Common question from Muslims. Notice, Jesus says that all of us must honor the Son just as we honor the Father. One of the ways we honor the Father is through worship. Jesus says that we have to honor the Son in the same way. What happens if we don't? The verse continues. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Do our Muslim friends honor the Son? Not a bit. And according to Jesus, since they don't honor the Son, they don't honor the Father. Remember, this is the chapter that Muslim apologists go to in order to prove that Jesus was just a human prophet of Islam. The chapter that they go to when they want to defend Islam condemns them and their prophet and their religion. But there's more. Jesus declares, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Wait a minute, Jesus is the one who raises the dead? I wonder if he simply means that he raises particular people when he performs miracles. Because if he means that he raises the dead at the resurrection, we are going to have another theological red alert. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Ha! 
You see there, David, Jesus calls himself the Son of Man. This means he's claiming to be a mere human being, just as Islam teaches. So let's ignore everything else he says and go with that. Yeah, that works. As long as you completely ignore the fact that the title Son of Man, as Jesus uses it, is a divine title for a particular Son of Man that the prophet Daniel sees in a vision. Daniel 7, verses 13 to 14. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. I'm a son of man. There are lots of sons of men. But Jesus claimed to be this particular son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven, who would be worshipped by all nations and peoples, and would have an everlasting dominion and an indestructible kingdom. Watch how the Jewish religious leaders reacted when they found out that Jesus was claiming to be the Son of Man from Daniel 7. This is at his Jewish trial in Mark 14. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garments and said, What further witnesses do we need? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. The Jewish religious leaders understood what Jesus meant when he called himself the Son of Man. Muslims generally don't. So, in John 5, the chapter Muslim apologists keep going to, when Jesus says that the Father has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man, he's claiming to be the Son of Man from Daniel 7, who will be worshipped by all nations, including Muslim nations. Almost done. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming, when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice. Whose voice? The voice of Jesus, who is, according to this passage, the Son of God and the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Theological red alert again. Jesus says that he's the one who raises the dead, all the dead, at the resurrection. According to the Old Testament, who raises the dead at the resurrection? 1 Samuel 2.6 The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. According to the Quran, who raises the dead at the resurrection? Surah 22, verse 7. And surely the hour is coming, there is no doubt about it, and certainly Allah will resurrect those who are in the graves. The Bible and the Quran both say that God is the one who raises everyone from the dead, and yet Jesus claims that he's the one who raises everyone from the dead. Are these the teachings of a man who thinks that he's a mere human being, just a prophet of God? So, we've gone all the way through verse 29. And now for the very next verse, the verse Muslim apologists quote to show their followers that even the Bible agrees with Islam. John chapter 5, verse 30. Jesus says, I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Now that we've read the passage, something Muslim apologists never, ever want us to do, pop quiz. When Jesus says, I can do nothing on my own, I seek not my own will, is he saying, A, I'm a helpless human being, a simple prophet of Allah, 
or B, when I claimed to be the divine son of God, you Jewish leaders thought I was claiming to be a separate God who acts on his own, but I'm here to correct you. Even though I have the same nature and attributes that the Father has, and even though I'm the final judge of all people and the one who raises the dead, I do not act on my own. I cannot act on my own. I can do nothing on my own because I'm not a separate God. I'm one with the Father. Which one is Jesus saying? How do Muslim apologists read the Bible? They read the Bible like this. Their prophet affirmed the inspiration, preservation, and authority of the Bible. So, as much as they like to lie, they can't stop going to the Bible. But the Bible contradicts Islam. So what do they do? They go to a chapter that thoroughly contradicts Islam, verse after verse after verse. They ignore everything in the chapter that refutes Islam. They fixate on a verse that they can twist into something that seems to agree with Islam, so long as they erase the entire context. And then they proclaim to their followers, who have never read the chapter and are therefore in a state of ignorance, that the Bible agrees with Islam. And their gullible followers walk away thinking that Christianity has been exposed and that Islam has been vindicated. Do Muslim apologists approach the Bible honestly? Not at all. Do they handle the words of Jesus with respect and integrity? Not a bit. Do they honor the Son as he commands them to honor him? Precisely the opposite. So, according to Jesus, in the passage that Muslim apologists go to when they want to defend Islam, do they honor the Father? Not even slightly. Does John 5.30 support Islam when you pay any attention whatsoever to what Jesus is actually saying in the passage? No, the passage completely, utterly, totally contradicts Islam. Why do Muslim apologists go to a passage that completely, utterly, totally contradicts Islam, ignore all of the verses that completely, utterly, totally contradict Islam, and then twist the words of Jesus, whom they claim to respect, in an obvious effort to trick their followers into believing that the Bible supports Islam? Why do they do this? Because they have to. When your book affirms my book, but my book contradicts your book, all you can do is lie. When your prophet affirms Jesus, but Jesus contradicts your prophet, all you can do is lie. Dawah is deception. There is no plan B. The question now for our Muslim friends who are watching is this. Since you've seen as plain as day, that your apologists are liars. Since you've seen that they lie to you about Jesus, are you going to keep following them away from Jesus and away from the Father? Or are you going to honor the Son as the Father and the Son command? All right, so faster than, you can, faster than you can say mental hospitals, disabled dead kids, and hammers, uh, David Wood keeps bringing up <coughs> points that have been refuted over and over again. So uh, I just want to refute this video uh, using only the Gospel of John. Now, uh, notice how in this, you just saw that, uh, the whole video of David Wood. I didn't clip it. I played the whole video, or I posted the whole video, notice how David Wood in that video is quoting from the Gospel of John. 
he's not quoting verses from the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And this is a problem which I'll explain right now. According to Christian scholars, Christian scholars and conservative scholars, Christian scholars themselves, such as Raymond Brown, uh, John Barton, Craig L. Blomberg, etc. So these are Christian or conservative scholars, not atheist or liberal scholars, state that the Gospel of John is not reliable historically and is of anonymous authorship, just like the other Gospels. So, also, the Gospel of John is the last Gospel to be written. So, now that we know that the Gospel of John, according to conservative or Christian scholars, is of anonymous authorship and is not reliable historically, as in it's more of a theological document and not a historical document, reflecting more theological view of the authors of the Gospel of John instead of what the historical Jesus actually said and did, uh, that Gospel also is anonymous. Now keep in mind, according to Christian scholars like Craig O. Blomberg, <coughs> Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are anonymous, and later on in the 2nd century, those names, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, were put in these uh, documents, but notice how Christian scholars like Craig O. Blomberg are admitting that the Gospels are anonymous, or uh, they were written by unknown Greek authors. Also, the Gospel of John is the last Gospel to be written. So, so if the Gospel of John is the last Gospel to be written, and it's and if we don't know who the author is, and the authors, yes, that's right, authors, plural, are anonymous, how can we trust the document? How can we trust the Gospel of John when it's of anonymous authorship and it's the last Gospel to be written? And it reflects a theological understanding of Jesus as opposed to a historical understanding of Jesus. Now, I agree with David Wood that John chapter 5 verse 30 is often taken out of context by Muslim apologists and Unitarian Christian apologists. So I agree with David Wood when he says John chapter 5 verse 30 is often taken out of context because in context, David Wood is right. John chapter 5 verse 30 is not saying what Unitarian Christians or Muslim apologists are want, uh, wanted to say. John chapter 5 verse 30 is in context talking about you know the glory of Jesus and uh, the glory of the Father, etc., etc. Uh, and the context is talking about the divine sonship of Jesus. So that I agree. Uh, that I agree. But there are statements. But the point of this video is that there are statements in the Gospel of John which completely contradict David Wood's understanding of John chapter five verse thirty and prove that Jesus is not God or equal to God. In fact, there are statements in the Gospel of John that prove that Jesus is a prophet only, something that the Quran also says about Jesus, that Jesus is a prophet only. And I'll get to those verses, uh, uh, I'll get to those verses later on in this video. So what about the Son of Man? Now David Wood brings up this, <coughs> David Wood brings up the Son of Man uh, the concept of the Son of Man. What is the Son of Man? The Son. What does Jesus? What does Jesus mean when he refers to himself as the Son of Man? It means that Jesus is a human being, as that term "Son of Man" is used in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, Son of Man uh, is talking about mankind generally, in contrast to uh, deity or Godhead. With, spe with special reference to their weakness and fr uh, fragility. In Job chapter 25, verse 6, Psalms chapter 8, verse 4, Psalms chapter 144, verse 3, uh, Psalms 146, verse 3, Isaiah chapter 51, verse 12, etc. So the Son of Man in the Bible means like a human being. It doesn't mean like, you know, the divine Son of God or... You know God. So when Jesus is referring to himself as the Son of Man, he's referring to his humanity, or he's saying he's a human being. Uh, so Jesus, uh, when Jesus says he's the Son of Man, he's stressing his humanity and not his divinity, because the Son of Man is used in Ezekiel, the Book of Job, Psalms, etc., to talk about a ordinary human being with no special divinity or Son of God. 
son of Godship or sonship of God, etc., etc. So when Jesus is talking to himself about the talking about himself as a son of man, he's really saying he's a regular human. He's a regular he's a regular man and not the son of God. So this argument backfires against what David Wood is trying to argue. <clears throat> Since David Wood used the Gospel of John only to try to prove to try to prove his point about Jesus, uh, about Jesus being, uh, I will only use the Gospel of John in this video to prove that Jesus and God as separate and distinct beings, and that Jesus cannot be God or co-equal to God. I'll also show that Jesus is identified as only a prophet, according to those around him. Later on in this video. In the Gospel of John, there are several verses which indicate that Jesus and God are separate and not co-equal. One verse in particular, or one specific verse, is John chapter 17, verse 3, which I'll uh, get into right now. John chapter 17, verse John chapter 17, verse 3 states the verse is saying that the Father is the only true God. So according to John chapter 17, verse 3, the verse is saying that the Father is the only true God. The Greek word used is monos. Uh, so the Greek word used is monos, which means only in Greek. So when Jesus says the Father is the only true God, that means uh, it's exclusive to the Father. It's not uh, it's, it's not extended to the Son or the Holy Spirit. The Father cannot be the only true God if there are true, or if there are two others who are God to the same degree as He is. So the Greek word monos means that the Father is the only true God, which excludes Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Thus, Jesus and the Holy Spirit are excluded from being God. In the Gospel of John, chapter 17, verse 3. Thus, Jesus is not equal to God according to the Gospel of John. Because again, John, chapter 17, verse 3 reads, uh, hang on, let me pull it up. Let me pull it up right now. One second here. John, chapter 17, verse 3 says, This eternal life that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. So notice what Jesus is saying, the only true God, the Greek word monos is applied here, only applies to Jesus, and, uh, or only applies to God. And Jesus is separate from the Greek uh, word monos, which uh, is exclusive to only God the Father. Further, in the Gospel of John, uh, Jesus tells Mary, after you know the alleged resurrection, that God is my Father in in your father, my God, in your God, in John chapter 21, verse 17. This verse proves Jesus has a God like the rest of us and is not God or equal to God. Now notice what Jesus says to Mary. He says that God is my father and your father, my God and your God. So Jesus has a God uh, and that God is the same as, you know, Mary Magdalene's God. So this proves Jesus has a God like the rest of us, and it's not God or equal to God. Therefore, he's lesser than God or he's subordinate to God, according to even the Gospel of John. Jesus, te Jesus teaches the woman at the well that the true worshipers shall worship the Father, and that those who do this are worshiping God in spirit and truth. Uh, Gospel of John, chapter 4, verse 23 in the Gospel of John chapter 4 verse 24. Notice how Jesus says worship the Father uh, which is God and not himself uh, Son Jesus. So Jesus tells the woman at the well that the true worshiper shall worship the Father uh, and worship God. So Jesus is excluded from worship. He says worship, uh, worship the Father and worshiping God in spirit and truth. So, God and Jesus are separate according to uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 4, verse 23 and 24. Jesus says in the, in the Gospel of John, Jesus said, My Father is greater than I. In the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 28. In direct contrast to these 
uh, clear words from Jesus, the orthodox formula of the Trinity says that the Father and the Son are co-equal. So notice what Jesus says in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse uh, 28. Jesus says, my Father is greater than I. So if, if God is greater than Jesus, as Jesus himself is admitting, that means Jesus is lesser than God, or he's subordinate to God. He's not equal to God. Uh, as the Trinity says that the Father and the Son are co-equal. If the Father or if God is greater than Jesus, then they can't be co-equal or they can't be the same. So Jesus is basically saying God is greater than him or God is of higher power or of higher essence than he is. That means Jesus is not co-equal to God. Jesus called the Father the only God in John chapter 5 verse 44. The New American Standard Version goes so far as to translate it as the one and only God. So uh, the Gospel of John chapter 5 verse 44, the only God, Jesus says the Father or God is the only God. He doesn't include him in that, in that statement. So Jesus would not have said this had he had he himself believed he is God, he were also God. So Jesus says that God is the only God in John chapter 5, verse 44. So if the New American Standard Version is correct in translating the Greek, it should read the only, the one and only God. So according to the Gospel of uh, John chapter 5 verse 44, Jesus says God is the only true God and uh, that excludes the Holy Spirit and Jesus, further indicating that Jesus himself, according to the Gospel of John, thought that there is only one God and that Jesus and the Holy Spirit are excluded from uh, the power or excluded from uh, being in the same degree as God. Jesus was sanctified by God in John chapter 10 verse 36 says uh, do not say of him whom the father sanctified and sent into the world you are blaspheming because I said I am the son of God Jesus was sanctified by God but God does not need to be sanctified uh, when Jesus is saying I am the son of God it's a metaphorical term because if you read the Old Testament uh, God has many sons uh, you know, like uh, David is considered the son of God in Psalms chapter 2 verse 7. Uh, the king of Israel is considered the son of God. Uh, Solomon was considered the son of God, um, etc., etc. Israel or Jacob was considered the son of God, uh, etc., etc. So it's a metaphorical term not to be taken literally. Another point is that Jesus was not omnipresent, but God is. After Lazarus dies, Jesus told his disciples, I am glad I was not there. John chapter 11, verse 15. So, uh, you know, Jesus was not like everywhere. He didn't know everything about, you know, everything about everywhere. But God knows. God is all knowledgeable. But Jesus didn't have, you know, unlimited knowledge or he didn't have all knowledge or he didn't, he wasn't everywhere at once. You know, so after Lazarus dies, Jesus tells his disciples, I, I'm glad I was not there. So Jesus was not there like God was there when uh, Lazarus died. So this shows that God has better or God has more power than Jesus. Therefore, Jesus cannot be God or, or share equal powers or equal abilities as God has. As God can be everywhere, but Jesus was not everywhere. He was limited in where he was. The people around Jesus identified him as a prophet, a not God or the divine son of God. In the Gospel of John, chapter 4, verse 13 to 19, the woman identifies Jesus as a prophet only. 
uh, John chapter 6, verse uh, 10 to 14, the people around Jesus identify him as a prophet only and not as God or the Son of God. So according to the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 4 and chapter 6, the people around Jesus identified him as a prophet and not as God or the Son of God. Even the people in the Gospel of John believed that Jesus was a prophet only, as these verses indicate. Those verses don't indicate or those verses don't say that the people around Jesus were saying Jesus is the Son of God or God, etc. Or the Divine Son of God. They say the people around Jesus identify him as a prophet only. So, Jesus is identified as a prophet only according according are the people according to the gospel of john identify jesus as a prophet only and they don't identify himself as any they don't identify him as anything else and jesus didn't correct them jesus didn't say yeah i'm a prophet and i'm the god and i'm the son of god he just jesus is basically admitting that he's a prophet only because the people around him are identifying him as a prophet and jesus is not correcting them he's a, so jesus is admitting that he's a prophet only according to you know, the Gospel of John, chapter 4, and the Gospel of John, chapter 6. So the people around Jesus identified him as a prophet, and not God or the Son of God, uh, for, uh, thus implying that Jesus is identified as a prophet only, and not God or the Son of God. So the conclusion, the conclusion we can see from this is that although David Wood is right, that Muslim apologists and Unitarian Christian apologists take out, take John chapter 5 verse 30, John chapter 5 verse 30 out of context. Other verses in the Gospel of John, like those verses I just cited, make it clear that Jesus and God are not equal and they are separate beings. Uh, the people around Jesus identified him as a prophet. Uh, Jesus himself said that he has a God. Uh, and that God is greater than him. So Jesus cannot be co-equal to God, and Jesus has a God, uh, thus proving that Jesus himself is not God or co-equal to God. Jesus has a God and says God is the only, is God is the only God, further proving this point that Jesus is not God or co-equal to God. And according to the Gospel of John, uh, since David would use that video, Jesus, or they would use only that gospel. Jesus has a God, and he's lesser than God, and he's identified as a prophet. So, according to the gospel of John, you know, if you read those verses, it disproves David Wood's point. Because although David Wood is right about John chapter 5, verse 30, we see that the people identified Jesus as a prophet only. Jesus says he has a God, and that God is greater than him. Thus, Jesus is a prophet, and he's lesser than God, and he's not of the same essence as God, and he has, uh, and he's uh, limited. Jesus is limited, but God is unlimited, according to the New Testament. So, the Gospel of John actually proves what Muslims believe that that Jesus thought, Jesus taught that there was only one God, and the people around Jesus identified him, identified him as a prophet. And uh, Jesus is lesser than God, thus, uh, thus proving that the Islamic claim is right, that Jesus is a prophet, or Jesus is identified as a prophet only according to the people. And Jesus thought, Jesus thought that there was only one God and that God is greater than him. And Jesus, and Jesus thought that he is not co-equal to God and he has a God. So if Jesus has a God and he's and he's and he's lesser than God, that means Jesus is a um, is subordinate to God, and Jesus is a prophet only, as the people in the Gospel of John identify Jesus as a prophet. So the conclusion the conclusion we can reach is that the Gospel of John makes it clear that Jesus and God are not equal and are separate beings, and Jesus has a God, thus cannot be co-equal to. God, according to uh, the Gospel of John. Stay tuned. More videos coming up ahead.